Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Inchain podcast. Today I have Pranav with me. Pranav is the co-founder at, and managing partner at Woodstock Fund and today we are going to talk to him more about his experience running his fund and you know he has been backing projects very interesting projects recently and uh, yeah we'll we'll talk to him more about that and his investment thesis and and so on. So first of all thanks Pranav uh, for coming on our call and uh, yeah great great to have you. I know thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity and I think one thing that excites me about this space is youngsters who are doing amazing stuff and I know I really follow I've been following you for the past 6 months to let's say about a year and some amazing stuff what you've done so far for for people who might not know about Woodstock and you know yourself um can you give a background and how you got how you started how you started with it you know how you even got into crypto and stuff So uh Arnav I think uh, let me take a slightly uh, longer route to share with you because this is very close to my heart. So in many ways uh, I mean uh, when I started my journey journey as an engineer I was extremely interested in technology and I wanted to get to the bottom of it and really understand the intricacies. Then I figured out that in many ways uh, the kind of research which was happening or the kind of uh, focus that was on technology was more I would say uh Uh, theoretical and it was less about practicing so it sort of you know veered me towards management side so i started you know reading a lot about management and stuff very early days in my engineering which is almost like seems to be like previous life almost like you know two decades back and then uh, i was uh, you know sort of uh, got into that rabbit hole really loved the whole aspect of engaging with people getting the best out of them and then uh, the next thing was uh, i consciously chose to be uh into a uh, technical sales for let's about 3 and 1/2 4 years renewable energy i was in machining side etc gave me a very good understanding of how manufacturing the you know very uh, foundational technologies actually play in terms of uh, creating real products and services that you all consume it was very interesting intriguing but it was also a bit more complicated and it was very clear to me that i, I wanted to understand finance a lot more so the next thing i knew was i joined uh, uh you know uh then i went for my mba abroad i was you know there uh, for a couple of years i was in philippines in the nations from in manila i was in hcc paris and you know had a you know great exposure both in southeast asia as well as uh, in europe and you know it made me understand that ultimately there are two sides of this coin one side of uh, it is technology and what's you know what it creates and the second part of it is about how do you understand the money and how money works so then subsequently this led me into uh, choosing a career path of financial services which spanned about a decade and a half and within that i've been across the spectrum when i started my journey i was formulating the forex policy the risk management policy of you know a chemical business of you know one of the largest conglomerates in india from there into corporate strategy looking at you know the acquisition of you know coal mines or let's say uh, focusing on due diligence of you know larger Uh, you know companies which are into resources etc and then finally looking at capital budgeting and then over the span of 15 years me and across the spectrum private equity asset management both option and domestic asset management is very closely involved when dubai and singapore offices you know were set up i was spearheading a team uh, which launched a debt fund in korea so all of that was heady experience accelerating accelerated experience a lot of st- stuff you know happening parallelly i was involved in post merger integration of a broking business then i was you know there in the structured finance desk engaging with some of the top bankers and seeing that which one we can coach as as a business uh, you know so that you know we can kick start the structured finance operations of course it has uh, scaled up you know by miles you know as we speak now but i was finally heading sme insurance across india and it was slightly a different take at the whole whole thing because we built a protection counseling program we set up sme university it was a three tier program etc so i was always looking at creative ways of solving problems and seeing that how i can be closer to the customer rather than you know being closer to the shareholders and this whole distance between the customer and the shareholder really really bothered me because i always wanted to position things that really matter to me to people somebody told me that you know if you can't consume the product that you buy that means there is something either there is something wrong with you or there is something wrong with the product so eventually it led me into a direction where i was investing in the fintech space i invested into uh, three opportunities one of them you know really worked out well couple of them you know hit a wall with the uh, incumbents in many ways the banking system because the cost of acquisition of customers is very high it made me realize that 
ultimately all of this looks good the innovation is happening but you need a very different kind of an architecture a kind of a structure in place which sort of you know uh, uh, is an independent stack just to put it simply then i landed up discovering bitcoin and uh, what intrigued me at that particular point in time was not the price of bitcoin but an amazing implementation of game theory so the i would say the the, the economics uh, and the, the person who appreciates the economics within me and appreciates the game theory which is the modern economics you know made made, it, made me understand that so many participants are so intricately involved into this uh, technology which we call as blockchain or bitcoin uh, as one of the earliest you know uh, derivatives of it it made me very clear it made me understand that i need to really understand this deep and the next thing i know i knew was that i knew the family office that had invested into zepay which was the largest exchange at that particular point in time these were the heydays you know this was like early 2017 the bull run was yet to begin but early signs were very clearly visible so uh, because i knew the investment director there he got me an audience you know with the founding team of zepay and the next thing i knew was i had i flew from mumbai to uh, ahmedabad purely because i wanted to have this conversation going and i had this rapid fire questions for let's say about 45 minutes and understood that uh, this uh, technology makes sense from not only the reason that i understood which is game theory implementation and miners and speculators all of them involved but also because you can build amazing global businesses out of it you know the profitability of you know exchanges were extremely you can say you know uh, eye numbing at that particular point in time and some of the startups at that particular point in time and even today also have you know globally scaled up become huge like i mean some home home grown startups in india as well for example like matic has done so phenomenally well built an amazing community taken it forward and uh, so yeah i mean all of this improved me and then uh, the idea was to build an investment thesis i tested out the investment thesis on myself made quite a few investments made money around it and it was very clear that uh, ultimately if this is all where the thesis which is emerging then it needs to be scaled up so then met with himanshu who is also founding partner along with me then met with other team members and all of us you know came together that you know let's aggregate a limited amount of money invest it let's see how this pans out from a thesis point of view so that thesis has panned out well we are sitting at about 10x right now and uh, because we got a lot of interest from family offices and institutional investors some of them are old colleagues from my previous life if i may say as in uh, financial services days and some of them were the relationships in which you know i have uh, built over the past year or so and uh, they wanted to participate uh, with a very structured feeling with absolute focus on legal compliance with a very disciplined approach towards investing not only choosing the opportunity but also having a firm focus on exit strategy so here we are focusing on the second fund uh, and raising 25 million there i think that's that's an exciting story so this fund you st- when did that start like i th- you met with the zepi team in 2017 and then like how, how did this start like uh, i think it's it's still recent right like um and uh, like you know many of us who ha- who joined during that 2017 time i think 2017 to 19 was quite painful um, to to be in crypto but you started a fund and uh, yeah you you st- you have you have uh, been successful as well so yeah how how was that story yeah so 2007 i think one thing uh, arnav is very clear and i think this is the message i also want to give to everyone who is an investor and not a speculator is that typically if you want to create wealth you need to be in the market for at least 2 to 3 cycles so somebody who has been there for 3 to 4 cycles you know and he told me that uh, if you are very sharp if you are very capable then two cycles are good enough for you to create wealth but if you want a very if you are a very disciplined person in many ways you are there and it you are also doing other things as well you need to be in a category or into a marketplace for at least 3 years to make money and for the first two cycles or let's say for the first cycle at least you will lose money so you know so that's that's the uh, i would say the insight you know, i will give so when i say markets in many ways this is also a market a 200 billion dollar market or 300 billion dollar market cannot be ignored and already we were talking about a trillion dollar market and i'm saying that let's say bitcoin doubles up in a from here you will be steering towards let's say half a billion uh, you know a 500 billion kind of uh, you know market size in any case right so just a question of how this market scales up how robust the technologies become how adoption ready they becomes how they converge with other, other technologies and so forth so this thought process was was very clear to me even when i stepped into the market 
the choice for me was about should i be in this market or should i not be in this market or in some other market and this market made so much sense because equity markets are very crowded i mean of course can't do anything about it commodity markets are very crowded you know energy market or any other market is something which requires a lot of you know capital intensive it doesn't make sense but here i was like this was a market which was shaping up i had a fairly good sense of you know people management i had a you know good sense of you know people whether they are authentic or not whether they can build stuff or not that's been my experience in trading over the past 15 years you know and i also had a fairly good pulse on how the technology works how the plumbing of the technology works so it was coming so naturally to me and also the other team members like especially when i met himanshu you know it was very clear that both of us were converging so it became very clear this was around 2018 end and uh, it became very clear that we have to come together and we have to start so very briefly i was also you know uh, working very closely with mohit as i shared with you amazing uh, uh, i would say child prodigy from a, a tech talent perspective he was also you know investing into this space it made me understand that you know the thesis that i was focused on it made more sense because what we call as let's say the top 15 crypto in this space is actually these are emerging products they were still fine you know traction in the marketplace so so having said that i think all of these insights pushing forward it was just a com- so commitment to the market doing the right thing building the right kind of ecosystem investing into teams with you know solid code solving the right problem has been the thesis has panned out so far so now we have invested into public dlt defi tokenization and web 3.0 protocols we have been talking about defi even much before this whole defi frenzy actually began even the first wave this is the second wave we just saw you know sort of uh, climbing down but we're expecting many more such mini waves you know to uh, continue over a span of time so it's been a fantastic ride i mean of course fulfilling from many quarters yeah yeah i think uh, many vc funds actually did miss the defi wave um for some reason um but yeah you you weren't one of those obviously um but yeah let's let's start now talk, to talk about our, your thesis because you know we have start that's where we are heading to so you can you explain like what are the sectors that you're looking at and what's the thought process uh, behind that um and how how do you think it has changed over time and you know we can obviously go deeper into each sector um but yeah what's what's your overall thought process uh, when you were creating the thesis um like how did you identify that okay these three or these four five things sectors are going to you know get big yeah mm-hmm. so i i think so i'm going to step back so let me share that our thesis was not was not blockchain our thesis has been uh, so let me share why the name bootstock let me start from there <laughs> so i think the name woodstock you know comes from this festival uh, which happened in us right and this uh, woodstock festival happened sometime around when the whole country us was bought on bought on i mean psychologically bought on because uh, in let's say the what happened in vietnam etc and there was a huge generation which didn't want wars they wanted growth they wanted innovation they wanted empowerment so various things uh, they wanted inclusion you know they wanted to experiment on uh, various things and Take it forward, taking it forward taking it forward so the experimentation there are other sad sorts of experimentation also that happened this was you know in the early days of the baby boomer generation hippie culture whatever you call it but there was the other side of uh, experimentation which was around uh, focusing on innovation the entire baby boomer generation was around creating possibilities creating organizations for wealth creation right hacker community emerged which was about creating those hacks as in those possibilities the good hacks and the bad hacks you know uh, dabbling with technology hardware you know in integration between hardware and software all of this came together in many ways it defined us the way we know it as a hotbed of innovation right so so the point is that in many ways i mean it was geographically limited right but now if you look at it in a hyper connected world uh, you know <laughs> i mean while we have been able to uh, spread covid extremely fast as humanity we also are capable to innovate extremely fast by collaborating together so there are no boundaries for example today i can have a team member who is in china another one in korea another one in us and i think that is the real strength of uh, uh, i would say crypto as a space i call it participative participative economy which is a new reality right so i think many people call it blockchain you know 
uh, cryptocurrency, various other things. These are just manifestations. The fundamental thing is about people willing to collaborate and connect and trust each other and sort of create something which is much bigger than what they could create individually. Right? So the macro thesis is around that there's a phenomenal shift which is happening across four parameters. One is uh, social, that uh, if you look at the generation gap, it is you know, shrinking in the sense that uh, uh, the previous generation, the new generation, for example, this, the new generation which has come, it is born into technology, right? So in many ways for them, their ability to interact with, let's say, blockchain, Bitcoin, etc., will be much more higher. So there's a massive social shift which has happened. The generation, the generation gap used to be huge earlier, 20, 25 years. Now it is five years. So, so there's a massive social shift which is going on. Second is on the economic side. There was earlier, let's say, dollar, I would say, uh, focus because the Bretton Woods Conference after World War II. And now it has been all about can there be community-based currencies? Like, for example, if there is a community, can there be currencies which are beyond the money? Can there be other social currencies which could be there? So there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of work which has happened in, in this particular space. And Hag, uh, you know, sort of visualized this and he saw that something like this would happen. So the concept of sound money that we speak about is, you know, something which seems to be becoming much more real because those technologies are now available to us in many ways. So economic shift. The third shift uh, that we, is technology, which we have discussed indirectly in any case, which is, let's say, from centralized institutions, licensing, let's say, uh, Microsoft being licensed to, let's say, open source, and now open technologies, you know, in many ways. So there's a massive shift on the technology side which is happening, which we are also seeing in blockchain space and convergence of technologies, et cetera. And I think the fourth one, which nobody speaks about, but I think it's a living reality, is ecology. We have made an irreversible shift you know, to ecology in many ways. And I think it happened largely because of consumerism, industrialization, so there are consequences. Why it is important for us to know is that the adoption of technology will be in the context of the reality, environmental reality that we live in. So all of these four limbs are going through a massive shift. So in that sense, if we sort of, you know, uh, zoom in, uh, what is the holy grail? In many ways, this whole DLT space is like a convergence of all these macro trends. And uh, so in that sense, we came around that there are four areas which uh, will see a shift and this has been our thesis for the past two and a half, three years, which was public DLT, as in a public network or a series of public networks uh, have to be in place so that there could be more seamless collaboration uh, in place. We call them as public blockchains, but they could be even a holo chain, which is a peer-to-peer -peer technology. It could be a hash graph. So whichever technology it is, but it's a public networks have to be in place. This is thesis number one. The second thesis was DeFi, because traditional finance is broken horizontally and vertically. But uh, you can't dismiss the previous uh, financial uh, system. It has to be a bridge with the new financial system, which is the DeFi, which is an extreme about you know non non custodial wallets, about autonomy, about autonomous transactions, about uh, sort of you know uh, a lot of people don't want to pay tax. It's almost like a federation of their own. But I think somewhere it's about convergence and creating a middle path where you know both traditional finance and the decentralized finance meet. And they address the real issues about financial inclusion of you know people at large. So this is the second area. The third area is tokenization, because uh, risk. Uh, if you have seen successive cycles enough, they have gone from uh, risk on, as in we went through like you know we wanted to buy everything that was available in the market, to risk off, as in we don't want to touch anything. But ultimately, it is about distributed risk, which is the future. So let's say if you want to own a house, you know, Arnav, let's say uh, 50 lakhs or, you know, one crore, it's very difficult to come back, you know, immediately, unless you come from a well-to-do background or you have savings, etc. But even if you have savings, why do you want to lock it into a single asset? So can you like, you know, invest into, let's say, 20 lakhs worth of, uh, you know, a digital security kind of a portfolio? So I believe, at least we believe in the fund that uh, tokenization is going to be a new reality as more and more regulators embrace it and regulators have already started embracing. So SEC has embraced, MAS, which is a, one of the most progressive regulators in Asia, has embraced this. So it seems to be that tokenization is now uh, at the right uh, time to take off. And finally, Web 3.0 protocols, I think uh, not much to be said there because there are enough people who are proponents of it. Uh, I think a very simple way to put it is that uh, the new internet that we are stepping into 
is going to be more expressive, more human, more inclusive. So I think in many ways, these protocols that are emerging are building blocks of, you know, getting us there into that kind of internet. So those building blocks uh, will also unlock tremendous value. So these four areas, uh, public DLT, DeFi, tokenization, and Web3.0 protocols. Okay, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that, I think that's a very good um, explanation of your thesis and, you know, how ties up with your overall thought process um, of, of the world or, or how, how things are going to change in the future. Um, so maybe let's dive deeper into, say, um, I think DLT and Web 3.0, there's already, you know, a um, lot of content out there. And right now, these days, it's like DeFi um, and tokenization. Um, so maybe let's talk about tokenization first. So for tokenization, what like what sort of interesting projects have you seen already? Um, and, and in terms of, uh, so definitely we hear about real estate tokenization um, and uh, some, some other like tokenization, I don't know, maybe stocks or something that people say might happen as well. But uh, yeah, what, what do you mean um, when you say tokenization? What sort of projects are, are you thinking of um, that, that might emerge? Yeah. So I think just to demystify this, uh, securitization has been around for the longest period of time. As in uh, mutual funds have been securitizing their credit card asset portfolio or let's say their automotive loan portfolio for a fairly long time. They've been buying it as well. So they've been trading, they've been buying. So it's been around for like a decade and a half, two decades. So fundamentally, that approach towards buying a micro, a small piece of the larger portfolio has been in existence for a long period of time. So there is no innovation there. The real innovation is that how you can make uh, the generation uh, of this, uh, uh, basically getting the securitization done and the distribution to the target audience, which could be based upon their risk profile through a technology in a manner that, you know, there are no middlemen. So I think that is where tokenization comes in. So tokenization, what it does is that it addresses two problems. One is that uh, it securitizes in some ways, or let's say you can say unitizes, you know, larger assets into uh, more consumable uh, kind of, you know, uh, bytes. And the second is it also creates a very seamless mechanism to distribute digitally, right? So you can own that particular security or let's say that is basically a claim on that particular asset or claim on that particular revenue uh, stream of that particular asset, you know, uh, on in your wallet. And even if let's say you lose your, that, you know, digital security, you can always get it back, right? In many ways, because it's a question, it's a, it's a contract with digital contract which is available to you. So I think, so the, why am I going into this detail is just to give you a sense that we are, as tokenization, we are layering on something which has already been built. What the industry, what I would say the industry as a whole was waiting for regulations to be more clear on this aspect. Because you can't tokenize and distribute. Ultimately, if you want somebody to own the asset, right? The ownership, cascading the ownership to, through technology has to be recognized in a legal framework, right? And so I think this is, there is a lot of shift which has happened in this particular direction. So uh, it's pretty simple. Now look at it this way. Let's say if I want to invest into it. So you, you gave examples about, let's say real estate, the most obvious case, I totally agree with you in terms of tokenization. But I think look at it from a different point of view. Let's say today you want to buy a bundle of real estate in India, right? So people will say that buy REIT, right? But let's say if I want to buy a portfolio of, let's say, multiple small assets and I want to create that portfolio and I want to tokenize it, I want to distribute it to, let's say, you know, a smaller set of people and I don't want to incur a large cost of going through lawyers and doing all of this. Can I go to a platform? And logically speaking, there should be a platform wherein I can bundle all my assets and get somebody to have a unit ownership rather than finding one single buyer and waiting endlessly, you know, for... Uh, that you know buyer to appear and similarly you as a buyer you putting too much of exposure into an asset that you can't afford to buy let's say you know buying a house for example why can't you go for let's say 10 percent 20 percent create wealth around it and over a span of time as you have corpus and you see a downward market cycle you take a position you buy a house at a significant discount so all of this flexibility in terms of asset ownership is where tokenization is addressing as a problem space now you're right, this is about real estate, equities, bonds, which are traditional assets, which have been securitized earlier. In many ways, tokenization is an additional layer which gives convenience. 
but it also opens up another space. Can you tokenize digital assets? Can you tokenize art? Can you tokenize NFTs, for example, non-fungible tokens, right? Now, NFTs will become valuable over some time. If this decade is going to be about digitization and digital assets, then the digital asset where you can identify, you can have unique identity, a collectible, can be potentially more valuable. And you may not, uh, you know, people at large may not be in a position to afford it. So they may end up, you know, uh, owning a small part of it. It's also a tokenization in some ways, right? So I think the, the space is going to open up. And it's a question of regulation catching up about the distribution uh, structure as in the banking system and the non-banking system which distribute products also catching up. Um, I'm very bullish that for the next two to three years, this is going to be a massive wave. So we recently invested into Propine. Propine is, uh, is, is part of the MA sandbox. And the other investors, co-investors with us are uh, uh, BC arm of Singapore government. And uh, basically they are you know, focusing on tokenization. They already have a custody license, etc. And so there are many other players which are emerging in the region. But our bet is on the regulators who are at the forefront of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, I would say, you know, uh, creating the space for the technology to uh, solve the right problem rather than being lagging in terms of, you know, following the uh, technologies. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. I think I did follow Propine. I think uh, Tribe, actually, uh, are you talking about Tribe Accelerator? They invested in Propine, I believe. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I think real estate was... I think most of these, the issue is mostly on the regulatory side of things, right? Like the technology, it's simple, but to, yeah, uh, if the regulators are innovative, it's good to work with companies that are, you know, partnering up uh, with with those regulators and trying to push this forward. Um, and I think uh, if, you know, some regulators do it, it's usually how, how it happens that some countries are more innovative and then a model works there and then, you know, uh, more countries might adopt that model as well. In general, for NFTs as well, um, because you know that's uh, that's what's also gaining a lot of traction. And for crypto native people, um, th- there's like tokenization and like tokenizing things into NFTs, like real world is, is like what you can explain to everyone. I think that would make sense. But for crypto native people, you know, we look for um, some interesting use cases as well, like say having NFTs for gaming uh, collectibles gaming. and some some other um, like crypto punks, um, crypto kitties, and so on. So, w- what do you think about that as well? Like uh, for in crypt- in the crypto native economy, um, what interesting use cases or how how are you looking at NFTs in general right now? Yeah. So I so I think Anav, uh, you you touched upon a very important point, and just you know sort of touching upon our thesis, we look at from a social point of view. Like I mentioned that uh, people who are born in this generation, or let's say the generation which is like you know going, uh, let's say you know stepping in in many ways, opening their eyes to technology, etc. They are born into technology, right? So so just to share with you, there uh, there are quite a few people who are becoming permanent crypto natives now, right? What I mean by that is, and I think both of us understand what it means, it means that uh, they will not be using fiat at all. Because practically when it comes to travel, buying stuff, their Starbucks, etc., they'll be, you know, uh, using their Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. to purchase things. So there'll be these applications which can take care of all of this. So it's a basically a shift. It is a shift in the mind uh, in terms of how people interact with technology and how much they want to embrace the technology, right? So, so, for example, we all consume banking products, we all consume banking system. We think about diversification in the context of owning real estate. You know, typical portfolio is let's own some real estate, let's have some mutual fund, let's have some bonds, and then a little bit of digital assets because it's an emerging space. But there are already a set of people who are like, I will own digital assets, and through digital assets, I will own any other asset if I believe they are of utility to me, right? So, so if you now look at it this way, now this is a fringe element right now in terms of, let's say if you look at 100% as a you know, total pie, let's say there are maybe 2%, a 5% right now. When this 5% becomes 25%, already this will be a, you know, a trend which has to be recognized at last. And there's always a tipping point. And after that, the fence sitters also start you know, engaging, taking things forward. And finally, the rest of the world follows suit. We have seen this in not only technology, but we have seen this in practically everything that humanity, humanity does. So my view is that if there are crypto natives which are emerging, 
which can do anything, which can, which can live, breathe uh, in crypto, that itself means that this journey of uh, digital identity in crypto space or let's say uh, through collectibles has begun. So this has begun and it is irreversible in my view because this is through internet and, every, and internet is almost like a fundamental right uh, in many ways in uh, almost all the countries. So in that sense, if, uh, if I want to have an identity, so today I look at let's say Ethereum and I look at let's say I hold 20 Ethereum. That's not my identity, that's a value in my wallet. But if I want to have an identity and if I really like, for example, let's say Godfather as a brand and I want, you know, that unique collectible, which is, you know, available to be, let's say there are about 20 odd, you know, unique collect collectibles, you know, which are there globally. I want to own one of them. That becomes my identity. Maybe at some point people will also say that, hey, I, I like people uh, put their designations out on LinkedIn. They'll also put that I own one Godfather collective, right? So I think just a question of identity, how much you identify? as a native, do you think this as your own world? It's like a virtual world that you are living in. So the point I'm making here is that as this grows, as people find this more interactive, as other technologies like AR, VR also interact actively with this particular space, as individual identity, what you know happened through Facebook, that people have more identity through social media at times than physical identity. They will be more clumsy in terms of interacting uh, socially, but they are extremely confident, very clear when they interact, uh, let's say, on social media. So this trend is already on. This trend is going to massively gain. So uh, I'm very bullish on NFT as a space purely from this you know, trend point of view. And I think what the bedrock is this whole technology which has been built about, let's say, digital network, which is uh, blockchain as a technology, or let's say DLT as a, a multiple networks which are there. So transferring value from point A to point B or identity that particular collectible from point A to point B is going to be very easy. So this is one area of uh, sort of you know, implementation of NFT. The second area is derivatives, right? So can I have a right using a NFT ownership, can I have a right not only to value, but on the claim of an asset? So I can potentially have an NFT which gives me a claim on ownership of a house. Can I have an NFT which gives me a claim uh, on the ownership of, and it could be even a virtual house. I know it's already happening, right? Somium space and various others, it's happening, sandbox, and et cetera. Now the thing is that, can I have a real house? Can I have uh, very interesting derivatives? Can I, can, I build, can I build my own portfolio and can I sell it in the marketplace, right? Through the tools which are available to me. Can somebody buy a stock of those derivatives which I have built through NFTs? So my personal view is that this is like a huge rabbit hole and a lot of interesting applications will come out of it and tremendous value will be generated. Okay, understood. Yeah, I think that, that also gives me a good framework to think about NFT space. Um, yeah, th thank you for that. Um, for, for coming to DeFi now, so yeah, like how, how are you looking at DeFi currently? So we have, you know, uh, the total value logged in DeFi has increased quite a lot in the past few months and uh, the like Aave and Wi-Fi curve some some products have emerged which solve a real problem um and and they are getting used um and i think they will continue to get used like even for like for ave you know uh, even centralized uh, market makers um like uh, if if they want to have if they have some asset uh, that they are lacking in and they are doing market making on an exchange they can you know use ave to get a good uh, like they can use some of their token to get uh, access to another token that they want to um, that they needed to provide liquidity in an exchange and so i think like a lot of interesting use cases have come up and i, I don't see this actually going down from here but still um, if if you have to back more projects um, yeah what's what's your investment thesis right now for defi obviously you can you can share whatever you want uh, that if you want to keep some things private <laughs> that that's fine as well yeah, no, happy to share. So, uh, Anna, when we started uh, investing into DeFi, our thesis was that ultimately uh, this is going to only grow from here. And the reason is very simple because financial engineering is a very well known field in many ways. So, I mean, of course, let's say if you look at, let's say, people who are MBAs who are potentially going to be listening to this podcast or who are engineers who are interested in finance and potentially they have been in US, etc., they would know that financial engineering is a proven field. So what it does is that it's an intersection of finance and engineering. 
as in how you sort of rewire finance in a manner that you achieve a particular objective right so accounting is a very straight jacketed field uh, corporate finance is a very straight jacketed field of course there are innovative elements you can be creative around it this structured finance etc but financial engineering is all about creativity it's about building blocks how do you get them together now this whole building block around technology was not available so financial engineering was in many ways the backyard of investment banks and uh, this is where they used to make huge amount of money build their products and all that stuff right now with defi as a space and especially with smart contracts evolving to such an extent smart contracts audit happening there's so such a uh, experienced solidity developers or let's say even other rust developers etc you know uh, becoming sort of a tribe of its own it's not a scattered tribe it's an organized tribe whether you call it ethereum foundation or there are multiple other you know uh, umbrellas under which you know they're organized it basically gives uh, this uh, this as a shape of an industry right in so that means that it has given tools in the hands of talented people to build application financial engineering applications let's look at it this way why defi right so now what's happening is that many of the people who first built these applications they were techies they did not come from finance background right but they they were crypto natives so they understood that how crypto as a space works so out of let's say 100 applications 10 applications made so much sense for example aave you are saying definitely makes so much sense right became valuable as well market also recognized compound etc and so on and so forth right now the thing is that what are the applications which solve real user problems these are not plain lending and borrowing applications right the more complex applications which would be the, would be the ones wherein you can do let's say derivatives you can create your own tools you can have uh, you can aggregate liquidity right you can do cashless transactions uh, you can uh, uh, potentially you know have a very universal kind of an interface for example as a uni lend for example a universal kind of a a lending platform you know so to say so different people are solving different problems and uh, i think defi as a space has evolved tremendously so in the first hype cycle i will use the word hype cycle i like you know what uh, jamie uh, you know mentions in his article i sort of very i concur with him and i also mentioned this to him as well is that the first hype cycle was about getting the technology building blocks right so when the market went to let's say about 800 million dollar valuation and then contracted a bit before it went through the next push so in that zone the the technology broke smart contracts were hacked drained out etc and i think what was a hard learning is that if you are a serious entrepreneur you need to get your smart contracts audited and then the next cycle came wherein let's say we went to a different kind of a frenzy in terms of liquidity mining right uh, and and then uh, subsequently it has been about you know eventually any commercial activity which is not based upon real economic value creation eventually tapers off there is a margin utility curve that catches up but the technology is proven the governance is getting fixed so defi as a space eventually has a bright future because this is about building rails with traditional finance so integration with the payment gateways digital uh, security ecosystem for example you know can be integrated as well building uh, aml checks kyc aml checks earlier kyc and aml checks were mentioned in the same breath and there was resistance by the crypto natives that you know why should we go for it but if you want to be aligned and with the traditional finance you need to go for it so there are solutions which to on chain aml checks you need not do kyc so defi has a new elixir in many ways that as long as the aml checks are done well as long as the money that is coming is all legit and clean and if you have not done kyc it's fine the regulators are creating that, that kind of flexibility for various applications so things are all coming together for a next massive wave of defi to emerge so our thesis has been very simple so for all of for people for uh, good projects to go through these waves and emerge stronger they need to have a very strong uh, backbone of a very solid technology team usually a prodigy developer or let's say at least a pro- prodigy development team uh, which can really solve the problem with the leanest and the cleanest code possible so this is one the second is a business team which understands how to communicate how to collaborate with other projects you know how do you sort of you know uh, build uh, uh, strategically uh, bridges with traditional uh, finance players etc so these are the kind of teams that we are investing into who have that potential of putting it all together and day in and day out finding ways and means of uh, breaking boundaries and then finally breaking out in the marketplace so they are also they also need to be very savvy teams 
So we are on, perpetually on the hunt of such teams and backing them. We have uh, recently backed quite a few of them. And I'm just sharing a few names like, for example, Frontier. We are extremely excited about Frontier. So Frontier has been started by our ex-CTO of uh, Woodstock, uh, Ravindra. So he created tremendous impact when he was closely working with us. And when he started Frontier as a journey, I still remember that he had he got this Eureka moment. He was like, Pranam, I want to ch chat with you. And this was like 2, two o'clock in the night, you know, we were in Dubai. And I was like, yeah, Ravindra, I'm understanding what you're saying, what you're saying, but I trust you. So I know you'll do the right thing, but uh, how far they have come and how much they've built and what passion with which you know, they have built is truly inspiring. You know, it gives me so much of energy. Frontier is one application. Of course, uh, Uniland is another one. Chandresh, I've known him since Matic days. His energy, his super, he's a, I mean, in many ways, he's a, like a superman. The way he sort of engages, never sleeps, just gets things done. He's, he's a bull in that sense. So Uniland is another one. When you look at Paraswap, Munir has done an amazing stuff in terms of building a DeFi community, you know, understanding the pain points, building this into Paraswap, you know, as the market, you know, keeps on going through cycles, has been constantly seeing that how volumes comes in into Paraswap. So another good one. Similarly, Alliance Block, I've known Alliance Block team for the past, you know, two and a half years or so. So they're building a bridge with, you know, traditional banks, with, you know, stock exchanges, with uh, private banks, especially in Switzerland, Europe, and, you know, DeFi as a space. So that's another interesting one. And uh, I mean, of course, you know, uh, there are, you know, quite a few, like Covalent, for example. Covalent, I would call it DeFi's play, but in a way it is DeFi because people consume the feeds and the data query tool. Uh, so Frontier is a consumer, CoinGecko is a consumer. So there is allied technologies around DeFi. So I'm just, I just shared some of the names. So if I missed out on anyone, it does not mean that I, I, I love those companies lesser. It, is, it just means that I'm just, being conscious of the time uh, that we have in the podcast. So yeah, it's good that we started talking about the names as well. Um, so in general, like uh, I've seen, you know, that uh, you have you have a global portfolio, but in, in terms of Indian projects that are coming up, I see Woodstock everywhere. Like all, all the good Indian projects have, um, yeah, they have Woodstock as maybe not as the lead investor, but um, in 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 their seed round. Um, so in in general, like what uh, what sort of geographical trends have you seen um, when when you have been looking in investing in crypto? Um, because most of the innovation, um, you know, started for at least in the West, uh, Aave, Compound, and all these projects. Um, and and the users were in the east you know that when it's it's like when china wakes up or korea wakes up you know then then when there's a lot of chance that price of things moves um then but uh, yeah so how wh why did you start believing in indian projects and asian projects before everyone um and uh, what's your thesis when you are looking for job like in uh, geographical trends in in founding teams so, uh, Anil, I think all I can say here is that uh, ultimately the innovation is happening into, uh, let's say one is definitely US. US is a hotbed of innovation, that to Valley. Valley has been always at the forefront of innovation. Then the second is uh, UK in some ways, Germany, especially area in and around Berlin is another space. And then France also, some projects have done exceptionally well there. And uh, of course, Korea, and you know some parts of China we can't miss out, you know completely. They have been huge. Uh, there are affirmative regulations in uh, Japan as well. There are a few projects that came out of, uh, especially Melbourne and Sydney, so Australia as well. Been a lot of concentration of uh, good quality teams, good quality projects. I think it's been all about ecosystem. So wherever there is a local ecosystem, there is a, there is a support system. It sort of gives you a lift as a project. There's a playbook. So, you know, uh, there's always a playbook to success when uh, the industry is just, you know, sort of uh, taking off. Now, this playbook is in many ways is known to various people, right? Wherever there's an ecosystem. So, there is a playbook in, for example, in many ways, this playbook only emerges with experience. So, across the world, we have venture partners, our advisors, and then also uh, friendly funds. They also keep on sharing leads, connections, etc. It's not about that, you know, it's one geography versus another. But uh, in India, why? I think that is the question that you're asking. And the reason is very simple because let's say a, a significant section of the team is based out of India. So we understand the Indian ecosystem extremely well. 
Uh, so that's one part of the reason. The second part of the reason is that India has the largest English speaking deaf community in the world. And uh, in many ways, there's a lot of hunger. We have not yet reached that point of nirvana from a, from a wealth creation sense as a country. So there's a lot of hunger. There is also a middle class drive to prove themselves, right? And here is an opportunity in blockchain space wherein you can do genuine work, you can create, you can solve a genuine problem. You, need, you don't require expensive infrastructure to solve that problem. You just need your mind. You need some basic tools, some basic funding to be available. And you know, collaborating with you know, an existing network globally, which is in place. And you can unravel your high quality product or let's say high quality platform or application to the world. And you know, unlock tremendous value. So this is the playbook I was talking about. So this playbook has been in many ways, it emerged because the first wave was exchanges in India. And let's say some of the exchanges did, you know, did well and I'll not take names which exchanges could not do well, etc. But the second wave wherein Matic, projects like Matic came in, I think they created a lot of uh, headroom and you know, uh, space around the projects to potentially think that they can become successful on the global arena. So there was a lot of confidence that got built because of Matic success. And from there, I think a lot of these, this third wave of projects that we are seeing, where we have invested into some of them, they got a lot of confidence that, you know, if you have the backing, we can always reach out to Matic. We can always reach out to somebody else. They can always guide us, help us. And so we need not fear about what's, what the uncertainty is there in the market. We just need to keep on doing the right things. So, uh, so the insight here is that in any market, if you invest into the wave two, it's a sure shot winner. Your risk is extremely low. And the rewards are exceptional. So this is true for any marketplace. So this is also true in uh, crypto market space. So in that sense, in India, we are at a very sweet spot and extremely bullish on uh, these uh, new wave of uh, investments even that we have done. Persistence is uh, one you know, that uh, definitely is there. There's one more that we're going to unveil uh, pretty soon. But uh, you know, uh, these projects have wings now because they also interact with each other. So they have an ecosystem of their own. They also reach out to Matic, for example. They have global connections in place. And they also have fairly good understanding of what can potentially break into, uh, a, I mean, what is a playbook, to put it very simply. I think uh, they have significantly reduced the risk uh, from an execution and scalability point of view. Yeah, I think, I think that definitely makes sense that, you know, that's what I've also seen. That uh, And I think the third wave will be from people who are uh, part of these startups now, right? Like uh, from initial... Then the second wave would would be uh, yeah so say for Matic and Instead App and so on, and then we have uh, some startups uh, like people who were working there. Then third would be maybe people who are working in the second layer startups like Persistence or Unilink or whatever. Um, anyways, uh, I have like one question that uh, I want advice from you mostly, and I think most people as well is how do you stay updated in DeFi um, and like and in general in crypto as well. Um, do you, do you also log on to Twitter, stay there for three, four hours or more? <laughs> and, uh, discord telegram, like, I, yeah, is it, is it always on or are you just, uh, you know, thinking long term and, uh, yeah, just, just, uh, thinking long term, trying to understand, uh, or is it, a, is it a mixture of both? Yeah. I, I think it's a mixture of both. And uh, now I'll say that uh, this is like a perfect recipe for a burnout for somebody. So I will also take up that point, you know, uh, after I answer your question. So for me, it's about somehow Discord has died down uh, in my mind. Uh, Telegram is definitely on because it gives a good pulse of, you know, how community is perceiving a specific project, how the team is responsive, our team and, you know, from a communication and let's say from, uh, even from an evolution point of view, are they concurrent? Are they missing out on certain pieces? It's a good pulse check, you know, so that's a good one. Also, also some of these, uh, you know, Telegram channels have emerged as a good uh, place for staying updated with what's, what's the big news in the industry. So I, think, so I think these couple of things definitely I keep a tab on as somebody who's in the industry. Next thing is I, you know, also have my feeds, I've subscribed to some feeds. So let's say DeFi Pulse, of course, I track. But beyond this, you know, there are also other uh, specific uh, key words that I've tagged. So those news feeds I keep on reading, especially something which has to do with regulation. In my view, is extremely high risk and sensitive in this sector. So I keep myself absolutely concurrent to an extent that 
I can like have 10 hours of conversation only on regulations, you know, so I go extremely deep there. Then the second area which is very important is uh, evolution of technology as a whole in terms of what's new which is being experimented with. What is the new trend which is going and usually I take out time over the weekends to read specifically on specific areas so that I build a worldview. So what I've realized is that if you build a framework in terms of where things are going, there's always a trend which is there. You have to basically either you either lead the trend or you follow the trend. So my intention is just to spot the trend very early on, sort of, you know, build a hypothesis, test it out, and then finally be ahead of the trend as much as possible. So in that sense, one thing which I definitely do so that I don't burn out by overthinking, etc., is, you know, yoga is a very important part of my life. So I've been doing practicing yoga for the past 10, 11 years. Eating right, sleeping right, etc., has been a very important part. So it keeps me balanced, but it also helps me to zoom out and, and, and look at things the way they are. You know, without getting too drowned, either in greed or in anxiety or in terms of, you know, comparisons, etc. You know, so just to share with you, for example, you mentioned that Woodstock is in various projects, it's been investing, etc. To be very honest, it does not make any difference to me in personal side. And it's not about personal glory for any, anybody of us in the team. It's all about our passion. It's about backing best of the teams. We are a conduit. What is our role? We are custodian of LP's money. We are not here to create a name for ourselves. So in many ways, many of the, many of the investing companies, you sort of insist that, you know, please take off our names when you are inserting those quotes. Because this is not about personal glory. Because this is, and this is just a beginning of a long journey, right? So we are maybe one and a half, two years into this. If we can continue this momentum for the next five years, you'll be, you'll be in a very formidable position where people who come into Woodstock Fund, who join Woodstock Fund, You'll find a lot of meaning, a lot of fulfillment. I think that would be more fulfilling because eventually wealth creation has its own marginal utility. Uh, uh, so I hope I would answer your question by touching upon something which is also valuable. I think don't burn out is my limited point. Don't burn out. Just focus on the right things. This is one of the many things that you do in life. And uh, so that you can create something valuable. It's very important for you to zoom in and zoom out. You need to have both abilities. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I think I think that's that's good. Um, yeah, I personally also now for the past one month, I yeah, I think I was I got a bit burnt out because you know the sushi thing and then everything that started was so much stuff happening. But um, now I think it's uh, yeah, people you need to create your own methodology of staying updated. Like for me, I just create some Twitter lists and then you know I just uh, spend some time in the evening uh, or at night just to see what's happening and. Also, some uh, Substacks that I've subscribed to. Um, that covers things quite well, uh, Pranav. Um, how how can people reach out to you? And uh, yeah, any any other interesting thing you like to share? Yeah. No, I think uh, only thing I would like to share is that uh, whether it is running a fund or building a startup is one aspect of your life, and you should do whatever you do extremely well with lots of passion, lots of involvement. Because that's what you will remember over a span of time, right? And for those people who are in it for the short term, speculating, potentially, uh, let's say, you know, maybe also erring on the wrong side of being a bad actor in the space, my only suggestion to them is that you have only one life, right? And the best way is that, that you know, you utilize your time in a manner that you are able to create something formidable that gives you a lot of confidence to do other things in your life, right? So my suggestion to youngsters and my suggestion to all fellow builders would be to focus on solving the right problems and uh, doing the right thing. Uh, and that will take you forward. It will give you so much of confidence. So many people will come around to help you and support you in your journey. You'll find this as a very magical journey. This is what I've experienced in Woodstock. So many people came around to help us, help me at various point, points in life, the way the whole team came together. And there was a point where nobody cared about, let's say, you know, money or anything. They just wanted to build something which was very valuable. So it has been a very humbling journey. So when you realize that you are humbled by, you know, in, in your journey of whatever you're building, that means you're doing the right thing. If you're not humbled, that means you still have, you know, a little bit of, you know, waiting to go. So that's, that's the only message I'll leave behind. Uh, okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks for now for your message and uh, great, great chatting. And hopefully we can chat again in a couple of months if you, if you have the time. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks. A lot. Yeah. So Anav, thank you very much and I wish you all the best and amazing format. Take care of yourself.